Todd has been following the Lord in ministry, especially in evangelism, for such a long time now. So here's a couple things I know about Todd. Number one, he is real. So you're about to hear a real word from a real man. Number two, he is a hard worker. So he has put his heart and soul into preparing this message for you today. Anybody who feels like they could use some more hope, he is going to bring something that you're going to need today. And anybody who's ever wondered what's their calling, what's their purpose, he's going to bring something good for you today too. So go ahead and just stretch yourself out a little bit. Get your heart ready to receive hope and more of your calling. Thank you. Let me tell you something. First off, that cookie-eating contest was something. <laughs> I hadn't seen nothing like that since my in-laws came over for Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay? That was, that was just special. That was special. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest and upfront with you. I try to do that. Um, I have, I have struggled over the last couple of months with some things um, in, in my personal life. I've, I've struggled with some um, things not going the way they should. I've struggled with uh, just, just questioning, should I be doing what I'm doing? Are things going the way they're supposed to be? Trying to make things happen the way I want them to happen. Trying to make things happen in my time, and it's, it's been a struggle, okay? It's been frustrating, it's been aggravating, and, and you know, quite frankly, I've had difficulties, you know, and I, I think we all do that sometime. Uh, you know, it, it, it comes around. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I got a magazine in the mail, and I, I get these magazines from, from my organization, and, and I always read them, and then I ask other people about them, hey, man, did you read that article? And they go, no. I'm like, dude, we all get the magazine. Don't you read the article? No. <sighs> what the heck, man? All right. So I, I read this article, and the, the article is, is based on, do we got it up there somewhere? We had it up there. Is is based on... Uh, Ephesians 4.1, it says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling for which you were called. And so I have to stop and ask myself, am I walking worthy of the calling for which I was called. Is that the reason that I'm conflicted? Is that the reason that I'm having difficulties? Because my calling and what I'm doing are, are not lining up. Because what I'm trying to do is not in God's time. Because what I'm doing, I'm trying to do it under my power instead of under God's guidance. And I have to take a step back and, and pray and re realign my priorities and realign the way that I'm, I'm, I'm doing my life. But I'm, right now I've got this, you know, spinning. I'm, I don't have an answer. You know, if you're looking for me to have an answer for you this morning and to preach a message on this and to walk out of here going, ah, I got the answer. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay? It's still processing up here. And I'm just trying to be honest with you and let you know that, you know, this, this, this process is up here sometime. And you have to keep it in mind and, and think about that. And kind of at the same time, you know, we've got the period between Thanksgiving and Christmas that we're going through right now. A time of traditions, holiday traditions. We have the children up here singing. What a joyful time. And we've got the gingerbread houses here. And I joke about the in-laws coming over for Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving is one of the most joyous times in our house. It's right around my daughter's birthday. The in-laws come, my family comes, we all have a great time at Thanksgiving. Tradition. Tradition, tradition. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. 
Don't be afraid. Have no fear. But traditions, and if you're part of the military, if you've ever been part of the military community, you know how important traditions are. Sometimes traditions are all you have. When you PCS or you move to a different state or a different country, and you don't even have household goods or belongings three days before Christmas, all you have is traditions. That's all you have to fall back on. And then you move somewhere, a new state, a new country, a new culture, And you pick up some of those traditions. You weave them into the fabric of your family. And before you know it, you have new traditions to carry out and to carry on with. And one of those for us and our family, we found over in Europe, was practicing the the tradition of Advent. We had never uh, celebrated Advent in our family or in the churches that we belong to in the south. We got over there, and they would have a, a wreath at the, at the altar with five candles. And the four weeks, the four Sundays before Christmas, somebody would come up and light a candle, and there would be a scripture or a brief devotional. And each week, you would come up and light another candle until the Christmas Eve service where they would light the Lord's candle. Each candle had a different meaning. Today happens to be what would be the first week of Advent. Today's candle would mean hope or the people's candle. Hope, bringing light into a dark place. Hope, bringing light into a place that's very dark. A place where you can't see a way out of. There was a time in the people of Israel's life that was very dark. A time when God hadn't spoken to them for a very long time. And it's a time that we're getting ready to celebrate now. The season of Christmas. You see, God hadn't talked to the people in a very long time until He finally broke His silence And when he did, he was speaking to Zacharias. If you have your Bible here with me today, I'm going to read with you some of the story from Zacharias. And we'll talk a little bit about hope. We'll talk a little bit about light, okay? If you have your Bibles, please join along with me. If you don't, I'm sure you can Google it, okay? That's what I do. I'm sure David sits up here sometime and thinks, why are all those people looking at Facebook? You know? Surely he knows we're back there with our Bibles, right? That's right. That's our story and we're sticking to it, right? (laughs) All right. As long as we're all good with that. Okay. (laughs) Melanie, don't tell him. Where'd she go? All right. Okay. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Now, it's funny in the Bible that they have footnotes like that. It says Abijah. And that's because in the Bible, they really didn't have footnotes when they wrote it. They didn't have those fancy little column things with A's and B's and 1's and 2's and 3's where you could go and look and say, who's this Zacharias character? Okay? You can actually, they could actually see that name, Abijah, and go back into the scrolls, into the back into the Old Testament time and see that he was a direct lineage of the priestly line. And he was authorized to be up there in that sanctuary. He was authorized to be doing the priestly duties. He wasn't just some yokel that got a call in the middle of the night to come and preach a sermon. Okay? He had legitimacy. All right? So that was important. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God, 
In the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when they went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. The whole multitude was there. Whenever you see stuff like that in the Bible, the whole multitude was there. That's a key point. You see, they had specific times that they had to pray. They had specific people at specific times had to pray. He was praying at the time that was allotted to him. So you could actually look back on a calendar and tell exactly when he was up there doing his priestly duties. And the fact that all the people were there means that there were multiple witnesses. So whatever this story is talking about, it's not just the writer's fanciful idea. It's not just the writer telling some kind of weird story. There were multitudes of people who actually witnesses this, who actually knows of this occurrence. Okay? Again, bearing legitimacy to the story as, as it goes. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Why not be afraid? God has not spoken to our people for literally hundreds of years. Why not be afraid, dude? Come on. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit of power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Hope. John, you and your wife are going to have a child. This child is going to go out there and tell people. He's going to give them hope. He's going to tell them about the coming Messiah. Hope. He's going to bring them hope. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here celebrating with gingerbread houses and children singing. Hope. John is going to bring that hope. He's going to give people hope. Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Evidently, he forgot to read the scriptures. He didn't read about Abraham. What a rookie. What a rookie. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you'll be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was... As soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. See, in Leviticus 10, 7, he couldn't just come out of there and go, something happened. He couldn't leave the temple until his service was finished or he would die. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, told him fantastical things. He still can't leave the temple or else he'll die. Imagine that. Whew, talk about conflicted. Let's flip on over to, uh, to uh, verse 57 over here. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered and she brought forth a, a, a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard about the Lord ha had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. They would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, he should be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what we should have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, saying, His name is John. So they marveled. Immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. 
Then fear came upon all who dwelt among them, and all these sayings were discussed throughout the hill country. Down to 67, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now then, I started this talking about worthy of the calling for which you were called. Zacharias is prophesying about his son here. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation to his people. By the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace, to give hope, to give hope. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. To walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. How am I supposed to walk? Look at this guy's calling. It's pretty incredible. He was called by the angel of God. A, a miraculous birth. Called to give the people hope. To tell them about the coming Savior. That's a calling. You go over to Mark 1, it says, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance. For the remission of sins, then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. I would say he did a pretty good job of walking worthy of the calling. <laughs> but what about our calling? What calling do we have? Surely our calling can't be anywhere as fantastical as John's. I mean, the Savior only came and died on a cross, right? That's our calling. That's a pretty fantastic calling. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Luke 14, 23 tells a parable himself that says, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. What, what are we supposed to do? How are we living up to that? That's what has me perplexed. That's what has me conflicted. Do I walk worthy of the calling with which I was called? That's a tough question. It's a tough question. But it's a holiday time. It's a holiday spirit. We have a lot of holiday things going on. And I'll, I'll be 
kind of truthful in advertising here. The, the holidays are important to me. I joke about this. I don't know exactly when my daughter's birthday is or how old she is. She's like 32 or something like that. All right? <laughs> she don't feel bad. I've been 55 for a couple of years. It's this thing I have with numbers, but it's all right. But when she was probably about five or six for the first time, um, I was supposed to go to a meeting across town. And this meeting was every Tuesday and Thursday, and it was December, and I couldn't remember uh, whether they held this meeting in December or not because of the holidays. You know, So I'm like, well, I'll drive all the way across there and find out. So I drive all the way across town, sure enough. No, they're not meeting tonight because of holidays. <laughs> okay. So I turn around and drive all the way back home. Well, I'm going to take a shortcut back home. And I pass this little church. Okay? And this little church has a saying. It says, living Christmas cards. What in the world is living Christmas cards? Well, I'm a dad. I got a young child at home. And I'm always looking for adventures, right? I mean, that's what dads do. That's our job. Fun and adventures. Mom's punished. Dad's fun and adventure. Okay? So, what is that? Well, it's, they got these, uh, they look like Christmas cars. They're like eight foot by four foot sheets of plywood, and they're, they're hinged together like a Christmas card, and they're painted like a Christmas card inside. But if it's supposed to be a person, like an angel, then it's a, a, a a person from the church dressed like an angel uh, inside the Christmas card, you know? And so it starts with Isaiah and the prophecies of Christ's birth, and it winds you through the churchyard all the way uh, finally into the sanctuary with the birth of Jesus Christ, okay? And somebody from the church dressed like a shepherd or whatever leads you through and kind of, you know, gives you Bible verses and explains, you know, on the way, What's going on, you know? And about halfway through this thing, I no longer care if my daughter's there. It no longer mattered to me. Because I realized this was about me. It was my salvation they were talking about the entire story could have had my name written all over it every one of those Christmas cards could have been about me because it was my personal story of Jesus Christ am I walking worthy of this calling. Are we all walking worthy of our calling? Just a question to ask. Y'all join me in prayer? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for the hope that you bring to us, Lord. I thank you so much for the joy that you bring into our homes. I thank you for the holidays that we're able to to enjoy and to celebrate. And Lord God, I thank you for putting each individual's name in those greeting cards.